Hello everybody, welcome back to this channel. A quick question before we begin our video. Now, look at this diagram here. Let's say the incoming flow of water is 100 ml and the output of one of the pipe is 70 ml. What would be the output here? Well, 30 ml, obviously. And that's the essence of what we're gonna learn today called Kirchhoff Law. And before that, just wanna remind you that if you haven't subscribed to this channel already, please subscribe so that I can help more people in the future. Thank you so much. Now, this is the chapter outline. Let's look into Kirchhoff's first law. The law states that the total current entering a junction is equal to the total current leaving the junction, which I put up a diagram here to illustrate that, which is also what I showed you in the beginning of the video. It is the same concept. So this law is an expression of the conservation of charge. We know that current, it means the flow of charge. If the input current is always equal to the output current, it says that charge is neither created or destroyed at a junction. So nothing is gone, nothing is created when charges move through a junction. And the sum of incoming charges per unit time will always be equal to the sum of outgoing charge. Let me show you some work example to illustrate this law. So if you look at this diagram here, they ask us to determine if the law is fulfilled. So what we can do is first calculate what's the input. You can look at the arrow to identify the input current. So when you sum them up, you got 4.5 plus 2.3, which is 6.8 ampere. And then do the same for output current. And you'll find that they are the same. And it means that the law is fulfilled in this diagram. Now let's move on to Kirchhoff's second law. This is also a very simple law. It states that the potential difference across each component in a circuit will be equal to the source. EMF. So to explain further, I have another example here. In a closed loop, there is a 15 volt battery, a 5 ohm resistor, and an LED with an unknown resistance. So this is what we're going to find. They also say that the second battery is actually arranged in an opposite direction. How are we going to find out the resistance of this LED? The first thing you need to do is to calculate the combined EMF. Because the two cells are connected in a different direction, therefore you have to minus each other out. And then we also have to know the voltage across this resistance and we can calculate that using the current multiplied by the resistance which will give us the voltage. We know that Kirchhoff's second law states that the sum of potential difference across each component must be equal to the source. And the source is 10 and the voltage across this resistor is 2.5. It means that the voltage across the LED will be 7.5. With that knowledge, we can calculate the resistance of the LED by using 7.5 divided by the current, which is 0 0.5, and then get 15 ohm. And that's how we can use Kirchhoff laws to solve a problem. So there's another example that showcases how we can use both laws to solve a question. In this question, they ask us to find out what's the value of I1, I2, and I3 using our knowledge on Kirchhoff law. So the first equation that you can set up is I3 times 5, the voltage here, I1 times 15, will be equal to 12 because that's Kirchhoff's second law. They say that the voltage across this component plus this com component should be equal to the source. Second equation that we can make is I3 times 5 is equal to 5 volt here. Again, you can see this is another loop. The two equations are derived using second law. And then the third one, we know from Kirchhoff's first law, incoming current equal to outgoing current. So we get I1 plus I2 equal to I3. So after all the equations have been derived, then we can slowly figure out each of the unknown. I3 is the simplest. I3 is equal to 1 amp using equation 2. So after we find out the value of I, we can substitute it into equation 1, which will give us the unknown value of I1, which is 7 over 15 ampere. We can find out what's I2 using first law. So another work example to find the resistant R by applying Kirchhoff law. So again, the first thing that I'm going to do is find out the combined EMF. I have three cells, one, two, and you can see that cell number one, cell number two, they are arranged in the same direction, whereas this cell, they're arranged in the opposite direction. So what I'm going to do, add this two up and then minus 15 volt, and that's my combined EMF. And that is important because what Kirchhoff's second law says is that in the total amount of potential difference should be equal to the source. So this will be useful. What I need to do is just get the potential difference across this 0.21 times 35 plus 0.3 times 15 potential difference. 0.21 multiplied by R, which is unknown, equal to 15, which is the combined EMF. And with that knowledge, 
I can get what the value of R is by just applying some linear equation. Now, why is the sum of PD equal to EMF? Voltage law is directly tied to conservation of energy again, just like the first law. It states that the sum of voltage drops across each component is equal to the source here. Just imagine that the energy provided by EMF, a lot, a lot, a lot, as they cross through one component, voltage drop, which is detected by the voltmeter. And the voltage drop across the component, when you sum them all up, will be equal to the voltage provided by EMF, which again, explain what conservation of energy is in this case. So this is what I just explained. You can read it up. Now, let's move on to the next, how we calculate the effective resistance when you have more than one components. So in a series circuit, it's pretty straightforward. We know that the current is the same. The only difference is the resistance. So we just cancel out the current. Then the total resistance will be equal to R1 plus R2, etc. What's complicated is the effective resistance in a parallel circuit. So this is what we learned in Kirchhoff's law, I1 plus I2 equal to I. And we also know that the voltage here and here will be the same because they're in parallel circuit. Therefore, I1, R1 equal to I2, R2. So using that knowledge, we can just change the equation around and then we'll find out that I1 is equal to V over R1, I2 is equal to V over R2. Do note that the V here will be the same because we are in the parallel circuit. And after sub subbing every value into this equation here, and given that V is the same, we can just cancel it out. And then we will have found out the equation to calculate the effective resistance in a parallel circuit. Now let's solve some question. How do we calculate the effective resistance in a parallel circuit? They ask us what the total resistance will be among all these choices and no calculation is required. So one thing you need to take note is that the effective resistance in a parallel circuit will be way less than the resistance of individual resistor. So if you look at these four choices, only 1.33 is lower than two and four. And because of that, that will be the effective resistance. Well, the last question for the video, how do we calculate the current flowing in the circuit? So first, we know that we need voltage for sure. We also need the combined resistance of the circuit. So I'm going to solve this part using the formula that I learned just now. And then we'll find out that the effective resistance of this part of the circuit is 4.54. And that's not the final resistance because we still need to add this up. It is connected in series with this branch. And therefore, I'm just adding this up. And I would have found out the total resistance and using the value here. And I would have found out the total current flowing in the circuit. And that's the end of the chapter. Thank you so much for watching. I shall see you in the next video. Goodbye.